Now, many years ago, as some of you know, I drove an old Volkswagen van. It was a pop-up camper style. I bought it for a few hundred dollars, probably overpaid a little bit. Uh, drove it for thousands of miles, though. And it was rust and dust held together with duct tape. And soon after I got it, well, I stuck a sticker on the back bumper, at least trying to hold that part on, and it said, please honk if something falls off. Maybe you've seen that sticker somewhere. And I was only half joking because, in fact, more than once, I would pull into the driveway at the end of the day to find I'd left another part behind. <laughs> a trim piece, a hubcap, a door handle, a windshield wiper, turn signal lens. At one point, I, I even lost the bumper and the bumper sticker somewhere on the side <laughs> of the road there. So. One day, uh, driving through Hialeah, we used to live out there in that area, nothing against the place, but the engine started banging and smoking and spewing oil. And here's the thing, if, if you've been in the Hialeah area or you're from there, you know that all kinds of things go on there, but <laughs> people stopped and pointed and, and all that at my car, at the van going by. And you know, if you can get people to stop and point in Hialeah, you're doing something pretty <laughs> special. But this thing's smoking and banging and all the rest, and so I limped that van home a few more miles there on two cylinders. Now, it already had hardly any horsepower, but this way it had about half. And so if you're not mechanically minded, let me just put it this way. That van that day, it lost a part from its heart, and it never ran again. It had to be hauled away to VW heaven. And yes, all VWs do go to heaven. But in the same way, you know, our human bodies are made up of many parts, you know, and as we go through this life, we will find that certain body parts, well, they simply fall off. You know, and all parts are important, I think, at least in my body, and, and yet there are some parts I really consider non-negotiable. For example, the heart part. That's a part that I don't want to lose. The heart is a part of your life that you cannot afford to lose. You can lose your hair, you can lose a tooth or two, a finger, maybe a toe, maybe even a leg or an arm. But your heart, well, you have to have that. You see, you can't lose the heart part and live for very long. All it takes is a couple of missed beats, a temporary drop in blood pressure or blood flow, and you know what happens? You get lightheaded. Maybe you've had that happen. You feel faint. And if the problem persists for more than a few minutes, well, you know what? We all know what can happen then. And so physically, the heart is a part we cannot live without. And the Bible has so much to say about the importance of that heart part there. In Proverbs 4.23, if you jot that one down quickly, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now, when the Bible says guard your heart, it's not really a physical health tips so much, although that could be important too. No, the verse is not talking about that little muscle in the center of our chest that is pumping blood even as we speak. No, as we speak spiritually, we understand the heart part. What is that? Well, it's the center of our being. It's the thing that we really hold dear in our lives. And when you see that word heart in the Bible, just remember it's the ticker, the thing that makes us tick what drives our lives, what it is that gives us life. And the heart is the home, really, of hope and joy and peace and purpose. It's where we get our life when we give our lives to Christ. But what happens when a Christian doesn't guard their heart? Well, we can quickly find ourselves feeling a little faint in our faith. We can find ourselves with a lack of hope, a, a loss of love or joy or peace, and begin to wonder, hey, what went wrong? And maybe it's, as this scripture here says, we didn't somehow guard our heart. In other words, you know, we can't afford to lose the heart part anywhere along the way in life. And so twice in this chapter here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are going to see that Paul uses the words, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. You'll find the phrase at the end of verse 1 and then toward the end of the chapter, the beginning of verse 16. If you just look at those two places, put one eye on verse 1, one eye on verse 16, if you can do that, and you'll see it says, we do not lose heart. And so 2 Corinthians, the book, is all about transparency. It's all about honesty. It's all about reality. It's Paul really bearing his heart, wearing his heart on his sleeve in so many ways, sharing with us his emotional and spiritual and physical struggles 
very personally. And Paul certainly did face some very difficult trials and difficulties. He had some very discouraging days. He spent a lot of times in prison and often in some very, very difficult situations. Even after he got out of those things, he had shipwrecks and all the rest. We'll get to read some of those in detail later in the chapter. But he had some seemingly insurmountable problems. You know, certainly if there was ever a guy who could have lost heart along the way, to want to give up, to want to give in, to become bitter and cynical and lifeless. Well, Paul certainly would have had every excuse, and yet he didn't. And so we will be wise, I believe, to listen very carefully as Paul shares his secret for heart health. The heart is a part we cannot afford to lose. And so let's look together at verse 1 there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you have your Bible open. It says, Therefore, since we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So there's the first time you find that phrase in the chapter. We do not lose heart. And again, the phrase lose heart, just so you understand its full meaning there, it literally means to fall down from exhaustion, to faint or to feel lightheaded. That's what he's talking about there. And, and I begin to wonder, even as I think about it in my own life, have you ever felt a little faint in your faith, like maybe you're a little lightheaded when it comes to your belief, tempted to give up and give in and say, well, man, I just don't know if I can go on. I don't know if I can stand straight any longer. I'm just going to fall. I'm just going to lose it all. And so if this chapter, well, it has an application as you see it, not only for you, for me, for us, every person has those times, those days where they feel a little faint a little lightheaded. And there's a few things, a handful of tips here that Paul gives us to keep from losing heart spiritually. And the first is found right there in verse 1. He says, we won't lose heart, in essence, if we live by mercy instead of merit. Mercy instead of merit. Now, many people, as you think about it, if you talk with them or you really spend any uh, personal time with them, you'll find out pretty quickly that though they may believe in God, they have maybe a interesting relationship with him that's kind of legalistic in its uh, approach. A religion of rules and regulations may be brought up with some traditions or things that they think are pleasing to God or whatever, and so they have kind of a pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's a Texas saying, but you know, it's one of those things where you say, I am going to do this on my own. I don't really need, uh, you know, God's mercy. I'll make it on my merit. I'll just try a little harder next time. If I blow it, well, you know, I'll just redouble my efforts. And so they go through life trying to earn, trying to deserve, trying to live up to and be worthy of God's acceptance, of his love. And you contrast that mentality with what Paul says there in verse 1. He says, we've received mercy. We've received mercy. Mercy. And again, I contrast those two words, mercy and merit. See, mercy is the exact opposite of merit. Merit is earn, deserve, you know, self-worth, my ability. Mercy? Well, it goes against what so many think. You know, people say, oh, God helps those who help themselves. It's nowhere in the Bible. I've searched it through. It's not there. But the truth is, God helps those who can't help themselves. Those are the ones that he really says, oh, if you need mercy, throw yourself on my mercy, you're sure to find it. And so you have that grace, that realization that God loves me because of who he is, not because of who I am. And so God's favor, God's love, God's mercy, that's what's going to keep us from losing heart. When we realize, hey, I can't earn it. You know, when I have... People talk about a bad hair day. Sometimes we have a bad heart day. You know what I'm talking about? Where it's just like if you could wear a baseball cap on your heart, you would, because it's like, eh, nobody needs to see that. But you know what? There's times when you can't earn it, you can't deserve it. In fact, we never do. Even on our good heart days, the Bible still says that it's deceitfully wicked and who can know it. And so God knows it. He looks at it and he says, that requires mercy. And so the only thing you can do with mercy, you can't earn it, you can't deserve it, but you can receive it, and you can enjoy it. And that's what Paul is saying here. Living by merit will cause you to lose heart quickly. You may have that can-do attitude, but as soon as you find out you can't do, you're going to be finding yourself losing heart. Living in God's mercy is such a different way to live. You won't lose heart. Listen to what Corey Ten Boom said. She was a Holocaust survivor. She said on this subject, 
She was a woman certainly we could also learn from, much like Paul, a person who didn't lose the heart part, even in the hardest part of their life. This is what she said, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious work of all. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. See, that's mercy ministry right there. That's not merit, that's mercy. And so if you want a little bit more insight into exactly what Paul was talking about when you think about mercy and what God's mercy means to us, how does it happen? How is it going to affect our life? Well, all you need to do is just back up one verse and look at the last verse of chapter 3. You're going to see 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 18. Don't worry, we're not going to go backwards the whole time. We're just going to go backwards for one verse. You know, you're starting to say, how will we ever finish the chapter if you go the wrong way? But verse 18 says in the last chapter, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Do you hear the mercy that is in that verse there? By God's mercy, we become like what we behold. As we look at Jesus, we are going to become like Jesus. As we focus on him, as we look at his word and we expose ourselves constantly to his truths, we're going to become more like him. They say that married couples begin to look alike after uh, many years. Now, this is very encouraging to me. It's a little scary for Lynn, all right? <laughs> Uh, we've been married 18 years, going on 19, and uh, I like the fact that we're kind of meeting in the middle and all that. We'll see if I can just keep looking more like her and less like me. That'll be a very exciting thing for me. But what you see there is, is God's kind of saying the same thing. Hey, you spend time in that relationship with me. The more you're with me, the more you'll be like me. And change doesn't come from trying harder to be like Jesus. It just simply comes from being with Jesus. And so that earned, deserved mentality, it can go out the window. And you don't have to lose heart as you have that exhaustion that comes from trying so hard to be like Jesus. See, mercy change comes from the inside, from the transforming power of the Spirit of God as we behold His glory. And so as you think about it, Jesus had a mercy ministry, never a merit ministry. He didn't have people come up and tell them why they deserved or could earn His grace or His uh, acceptance or his love with things they just simply came and said hey I am in need would you be willing to do something about it and so you think about that Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 maybe one of the most merciful verses in the Bible I really like this one Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 I'll read it for you it says come to me Jesus said all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you so much work you won't know how to get out no he says I will give you rest my yoke is easy, my burden is light. See, if you're coming to God on merit, that could never be true. But if you're coming to Him for daily mercy, that's certainly going to be our experience. So if you're trying to earn God's love, can I just tell you, stop in the name of love before you break His heart. <laughs> Think it over. No, see, God, God loves you because of his mercy. That's something we do need to think it over, not because of your merit. And so we go on to number two here, which is that we won't lose heart if, if we live for Christ and not for Christianity. See, this is what it says here in verse two. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age, that's the devil being talked about there, has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And verse 5, this is where we end this section. It says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Now again, I give you that little phrase just to plant it into your heart and mind. It says we won't lose heart if we live for Christ and not just for Christianity. Now some of you are saying right away, Christ, Christianity, aren't they really the same thing? Well, not necessarily, and I intentionally had them put on the slide up there, Christianity in quotes. Why? 
Well, because Christianity is a very broad term, right? It's one of those that's almost become so broad that it has lost any meaning sometime. And there's a lot of junk, we all know, that goes on in the name of Jesus. And so there are crafty Christians, and Paul's already talked about that. There are hypocrites who handle the word of God deceitfully, that do it for some mixed motive. And so, you know, people you love, your family, your friends, you can see them suffering, and you can see them in some cycle of sin, and you kind of try to share your faith with them in some way, and you know that the solution is Christ. That's what you're really trying to talk about. But so quickly, people want to change the channel and not talk about Jesus Christ, but Christianity. See, they want to start talking about, well, you know, a brother of mine was a deacon at a church or something, and you go, well, that's interesting. You know, or, you know, my family heritage is this, or one of my grandparents was a missionary and stuff, and you go, okay. You know, or this event occurred in my life, or that event. And, and we say it so often here, you know, it's not a relationship with a church or a pastor or a priest that changes anybody's life. It's Jesus Christ that changes life. And yet, so often, as you tell someone about Christ, again, they want to argue about Christianity. They want to bring out some atrocity of history, and there have been many, that were done in the name of Jesus, and say, well, that's why I'm not a believer. Well, wait a minute. What does that have to do with Christ? That's not how he acted or taught us to act. So just because somebody used his name and did what they wanted to do doesn't mean anything at all. And some hypocrites somewhere maybe has called themselves a Christian and that's the reason somebody uses as an excuse for why they don't come to Christ. And I know that's more than a theory because that was my whole excuse for 27 years of my life. Oh, Christians, you know, and all the rest. And then, you know what? I got confronted with Christ. Yeah, someone wouldn't let the issue drop. Okay, okay, okay. What if every Christian was wrong? wrong. What about Christ? What's wrong with him? Why don't you address that issue? And see, a lot of unbelievers will point to some human failure along the way for why they don't believe. I used to go to church, but I didn't like what I saw there, you know. Some person let me down. The guy up front or a person in the pew, they didn't do something I didn't like, you know. Sex scandals, those things go on. Financial scandals, political power plays, and all this kind of stuff, manipulative ministries. Well, Paul's already addressed that issue, and he says, you know what, we've renounced that stuff. That's not what I'm about. And maybe you have been burned by the church, but I doubt very seriously that you could honestly say that you've been burned by Jesus Christ. See, I've heard this excuse more than once. I tried Christianity, and it didn't work. And ever said that or ever heard someone, oh, I tried that. You know, been there, done that, what's next? You know, I tried Christianity. It didn't work for me. I'm glad it works for you. It doesn't work for me. But here's what the person's really saying. I tried Christianity, but I never tried Christ. And see, that's the simple thing here. It's talking about the gospel, which is just a relationship with God, not rules, not regulations. Remember, not the whole merit thing, not all that, but the mercy of God. And that's why in verse 3, Paul says so clearly, we don't preach ourselves. Now, Paul was a pretty great guy. He could have preached a lot of Paul, but he didn't do that. He even made the decision, listen, I'm going to exalt Christ and him crucified, and that's what it's going to be about. And see, I think when we as a a Christian world sometimes preach ourselves, we're really making a huge mistake. We're really missing out on a lot of the fruit that could come from our lives because we focus in so often on our perspectives or our convictions and our preferences, and we have them. Our brand of Christianity, you know, if you want to think of it that way, and we wonder why nobody wants it. And we wonder why we get in so many arguments but never really see (laughs) that many conversions. And maybe a part of it is that we are preaching ourselves. And if we're not preaching ourselves, what would we preach? Well, the gospel. The gospel, that Jesus Christ came to bring mercy to those who needed it. And you think about the gospel, you think about how clear and simple it is, and how we have seen here, as Pastor Pedro, I think, has just got such a clear grasp and clear anointing of God to share the simple gospel and not go off on all of the different tangents that sometimes come into Christianity. You see lives change through the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God for the salvation of all those who believe. And so people respond. Not everyone, of course, but we'll see amazing things when we preach Jesus and not ourselves. See, if we preach ourselves, we'll find out what we can do. If we preach Jesus, we'll find out what God can do. 
And so what's our role? Well, it's simply to preach Jesus and to live him and to simply serve others in his name. You see that there in that part. It says, for Jesus' sake, we're going to be your servants. We're not really going to preach ourselves or puff ourselves up. We're just simply servants of yours for his sake. Jesus is Lord and us as your servants. And I, I like the way it comes back and supports this same point, which is just this, for his sake. See, you won't, live, you won't lose heart in your life if you live for Christ and not for Christianity. Because a lot of people, again, they serve for the sake of the church or something. Or, well, you know, I'll do it for Pastor Pedro because he really... No, if you do that, you're going to lose heart. But if you live for Christ and not Christianity, you're not going to lose heart. You're never going to say, man, I did something for Jesus' sake. And I really think he forsake me. I, I really think I've been forsaken. Hebrews 12, verse 3 says this. I'll read it for you. It says, Consider Jesus, who endured opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What's he saying? If you look at him and you say, I'll do this, Lord, for your sake. I know what you did for my sake. You went to the cross and died for my sin. So you know what? Even if nobody else notices, I'm not going to lose heart as I look at him and do things for his sake. And so, verse 6, it says this, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't need to tell you that we live in dark days. Paul did too, but we live in our own special brand of dark days. There's things going on that Paul would probably say, Wow, that's pretty bad. You guys sin much faster. You guys can speed, you know, sin at the speed of light these days. You know, high speed sin. And so we live in very dark days. Hard hearts, a lot of them. That's what the Bible said that is. The end drew near that there would be hardening of people's hearts. And so Paul compares our heart condition before Christ to darkness, utter darkness. And he's drawing that parallel between what you see in Genesis 1.1, where God spoke into the dark and created the light. You see that it says that the earth was without form and void, you know, just a big bleh. And God says, light be. And there was light and soon with it life. And that's the spiritual analogy he's giving for our heart. It's like God looks at the void and formless heart of a person and just says, you know, it's dark. There's no life there. But he can speak into a heart and say, light be life be. And that's certainly what he did in my life and my wife's life. And so many of the people here in this room have experienced exactly what I'm talking about. You know what it was to be having your heart pump blood and you had life physically, but no life whatsoever spiritually, empty and void. That would have been a good description of your life before Christ. And so that comparison there, Jesus, the light of the world, shining into a heart and bringing out of that void life. And so it can be very tempting, once you have life and light, to curse the darkness. You know, to look on at the dark world and say, well, why are you the way you are? Well, because they're the way we were. <laughs> That's why. You know, it can be easy to forget all of that, right? And so we'll lose heart as we see just the darkness of the world if we're not careful. But when we preach Christ, what are we doing? We're not cursing the dark. We're lighting a candle with the light of the life. And so you see... Christian issues, are they important? Yes. Christian positions, of course they're important. But Paul spent his whole life around very good debaters. He spent his whole life around those with religious arguments and agendas that were very powerful, but it didn't change him. You know what changed him? Coming into contact with Christ. And he changed, just like that. It's kind of funny. I think of it that same way in my life. It's, it's that light of Christ that came into my life to light up my dark heart. It wasn't an argument that somebody had with me, although I'd had many of those in my life. No, it was simply somebody bringing the light of Jesus into my life. And as I came into contact with him, it's amazing how my positions, convictions, and everything else changed along with those things. But when you have a heathen heart, well, it's dark. It's void. And what it needs is the voice of God speaking into it. And so no amount of Christianity could change me, but just a little bit of Christ certainly did. 
And so that's the simplicity, that's the power that we found in God's word and preaching Christ. And so I personally love to share stories about Jesus with people. Rather than getting into some debate on some little minor issue, I just say, man, this reminds me a lot of when Jesus did blah, 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 blah. You know, you tell him about the woman at the well and how he reached out to her. You tell him about how he bent down to wash the disciples' feet. All of these parables that he told and everything. I've been amazed how non-resistant people are to hearing about Christ. And so often, just because of all the junk that's gone on, they'll really have the wall go up if you want to talk the Christianity position on things. But it's amazing. When you talk Christ with someone and their heart changes, all of a sudden they're going to change everything about them also. And so we preach Christ, and that's what you see happening here. Verse uh, 7, it brings us to the third one. We'll not lose heart if we look at our contents and at the contents of others and not their container, not our container. See, this is what he says in verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, what's he talking about there? He's talking about earthen vessels. Clay pots is the literal translation there. Containers. And the question always in a container, especially a clay container, I, I love the timing of this because those of you who will be here, and I pray it's all of you and all of your friends too, this weekend for the potter's field are going to see and learn a lot about this very thing in your clay pot that is you. But inside is the content. If you're a follower of Christ, inside is the heart part. That's the part that matters most. That's the treasure that it's talking about here. And again, it's not just the muscle pumping blood. No, it's talking about the glory of God because the Bible says that God has promised to be in those who believe in Him. And so the glory of God, the power of God, the presence of Jesus, the creator of the universe in us, that's the treasure that it's talking about, but it's wrapped in, well, not a very impressive package sometime, in us, in you and in me. And so God has put the most important part on the inside, not on the outside. And it seems strange for some of us maybe to think about putting such a priceless treasure in something so fragile. You know, wouldn't it make sense like if you had a priceless painting or something like that to put a really fancy frame on it? Well, I don't think so if you think through it. If you've ever been to a museum and you've seen fine art, Generally, the frame that's around it is very, very plain. Why? If you had a neon blinking thing around the Mona Lisa, what would be the focus? What would be the attention? Well, people would say, what, what painting? All I saw was the flashing light. And so, again, God puts a very plain frame in us around something so priceless, it's hard for us to even imagine that he would lower himself to that level. And so... The vessel's value comes from its content, and it's good for us to remember that. Why? Because, see, if you value the externals in yourself and in others, you are going to lose heart along the way. You're going to, because nobody that I know of, really, decade and decade and decade can go by without having decayed. I mean, at some point, you're going to find yourself falling apart. And so if you live for the Outside, where you're going to find life gets more and more depressing along the way. And you live for the content where you're going to find that everything is going to go up and up and up. Focusing on the treasure inside, the Bible says we can go from glory to glory. And so this is what it says in verse 8. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And so Paul here is talking about what happens to our clay pot, our earthen vessel here, which is that they get banged around pretty good by the pressures and problems of life. I don't know if there's anyone here who feels like maybe you got jarred this week, you know, with your little clay jar there. And so the words in verse 8 and 9 certainly can resonate pretty well with us. Hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. You're saying, yeah. That was my week, that was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and probably tomorrow's struck down there, you know, or whatever. But I want to put a couple of pictures into your mind. When I was a kid, maybe some of you had this, I had a, a punching bag. Now, you know, don't try to analyze and say, you know, kids had all this. That's an, I, I haven't aged a bit, have I? I look about the same as I did when I was a kid. This is a picture of me when I was 12. And... Uh, and I'm 25 now, so that's, uh, 
that's 13 years. But um, when I was a kid, I had that toy there, the Bozo the Clown thing, where you would punch this inflatable punching bag, you know, and this would, the, my, I had a sister for, you know, I still have a sister, but, <laughs> but uh, I think my parents got me this, uh, or her this, so that we wouldn't go at each other, but there it was, Bozo the Clown, and the thing about it is it had a weight at the bottom. It had like sand or something. I never really pulled it apart and found out what was in it. But you'd punch that little red nose, you know, and it would be struck down, but not destroyed. See, it would just come back for more. Whoop, you know, it's right back. And you'd give it super wind up and pa, you know, and it'd go down for maybe a little longer and back up again, you know, with that silly little grin on its face. And in all the years that I punched that thing, I never won a fight with that thing. It always came back again. And the second picture, well, if that one's not enough, another toy from my past, a Weeble. I don't know if you guys remember Weebles, but they were these little plastic people, you know, and, and they had a, an ad, Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down, right? <laughs> and so we are to be, as Christians, Weeble people. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, we're going to wobble. We're going to have things come into our life that maybe shift us around and spin, and spin us around and all that kind of stuff. But no matter what you do to a weeble, it just pops back up. And again, the common thing between bozo and weasels, you say, man, Scott, that's not very uh, flattering. As Christians, we're supposed to be bozos and weebles? Yeah. The whole thing is the weight that's there that brings them back. And the Bible talks about the glory of God in our lives, at the center of our lives, being like a weight, a weight of glory that returns everything back upright. And some of us have been struck down. But you can say, hey, somehow, by God's grace, by His mercy, I'm not destroyed. I've been perplexed, but it's not the end of it all. Just when I thought it was, it isn't. And so when we have that foundation of faith, it doesn't mean that we'll never have trouble. It doesn't mean that we're never going to wobble. But the trouble doesn't have to take away the treasure. In fact, it cannot. And so when things come your way, you may feel like Bozo the Clown. You say, man, I feel like I'm just getting boing, boing, boing. My little nose is, you know, wank, wank, wank. Or you may wobble like a weeble, but just remember this. You won't fall down. The Bible says that you will not fall headlong because God is there to pick us up. And you won't lose heart if you remember this, that you can be struck down, certainly, but not destroyed. And so Paul's picture, maybe it's a little uh, more, uh, I don't know, uh, a little more normal than Bozo and Weebles. But he talks about earthen vessels here, and it's a humble little jar with something priceless inside. And it gives us some insight, I think, into why God allows trials into our life. See, a lot of times we think, well, if God loved me, then why would he? And that sort of thing. Well, listen, God does love you, and so... You can just know that. You don't have to ask why on that one. But God will allow our jar of clay to be jarred. Why? Because then some of the treasure spills out. It's one of those things that people get to see more clearly what's inside our life when we have something that jostles it. If I had a coffee cup up here and it had something inside it, you wouldn't know what was inside it. But if I, if I shake it, if I jostle it, if I crack it, you're going to see very quickly what was inside. And so people really can't see the treasure that God has put in our lives as clearly as they can when the jar gets cracked. And maybe some people think in your life, man, you're just a crackpot, you know, as a Christian. And you go, yeah, you know, that's biblical. That's okay. Maybe they can see some of the treasure coming out. And you see in verse 10, it says, we always carry about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be maintained in our body, for we who live are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Now what is Paul saying through that in verse 10 through 12? Well, I think sometimes the best way to explain one of these New Testament principles is to look at an Old Testament picture. And so sometimes our life has to be crushed, as I've said, by trials, by hardships, by that jarring process for the light of Jesus really to shine through. And so I want to just take you quickly in your minds to Judges chapter 7. You don't need to turn there because I'm just going to summarize the chapter, but you can jot it down for your notes and look at it later. It's the life of Gideon that is told there. A, a great warrior in the Old Testament, but a guy who happened to be uh, a pretty weak guy who just depended a lot on the Lord. And so Gideon had 
a, a vastly outnumbered army. I mean, he, one of these things where the, the odds were so stacked against him, it was just very improbable that anything could possibly go on. And so he has this conversation with God, and maybe you've had one like this, which is, hey, God, we have a problem down here. You know, I don't know if you noticed it. And so Gideon says this to God, and God says, you're right, you do. You have a problem with the numbers in the army. And you can picture Gideon saying, finally, an answer to my prayer. You know, and God says, yeah, you've got way too many guys. <laughs> what? Way too many guys? I mean, maybe you need some help counting, God. I mean, have you seen all of them? And look how few I have. And God says, yeah, we're going to have to whittle that down a little bit. And so it gets whittled down to just kind of the bare minimum there. And Gideon's going, man, I'm not sure I want to pray again. But he needs to now. And so he says, you know what? We are going to have some special weapon. I just know God is going to give us like some kind of Bible bazooka or something in the Old Testament. You know, just something like one of these smart bombs that you just press the button and, you know, the whole army goes down or something like that. And so God says, yeah, I got a weapon for you. You know, the few of you guys that are left, uh, you know, want to make sure that you guys are able to win. So here you go. Here's a clay pot and a candle. You go, yeah, that's great. You know, uh, yeah, come on, God, where's the real thing? You know, it, no, clay pot and a candle. And he says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go in at night to the other army. You're going to get in among them, and you're going to break that pot, and the light of the candle is going to shine through, and you're going to win. You can picture him saying, what else you got? You know, what, what, plan B, is there something else? Now, what happened? The light confuses the people, the sound freaks them out, and they end up hacking each other to pieces. That's what ends up happening. The other army, just in chaos and confusion, defeats themselves. And so the New Testament principle, again, well, the weapons that God gives us, sometimes we think, I don't know if that's enough, or I don't know if that's going to work. But the Bible says they're not carnal, but they are mighty. And what are they? Well, it's just basically this clay pot and the light of Jesus within us and God's ability to crack us in just the right spots so that he can shine through. So we won't lose heart if we focus on the content and not the container. If I were to worry about the cracks, well, I'm going to be very, very worried. And so if I concentrate on the, on the contents, well, I'm not going to have those same worries. And so that brings us to verses 16 and 17 there. And we find the last of Paul's tips for spiritual health. He says we won't lose heart if, if we live for the gain and not the pain. This is what he's saying in verse 16. He says, therefore, we don't lose heart. That's the second time you see this phrase explicitly in the same chapter. He says, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction. If anyone other than Paul was saying this to us, we wouldn't be able to, to receive it. But he says, our light affliction, affliction, he's been through some pretty amazing stuff. He says, which is, but for a moment, is working for us. You might want to underline that. Working for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, certainly Paul's hardships had taken a physical toll on his body. We know that from uh, descriptions that he gave and, and that others gave about him. And so he had kind of like scars on his scars, you know, band-aids on his bandages and that sort of thing. And he had been in prisons, he'd been in shipwrecks, he had been beaten and all this. So his clay pot was probably pretty beat up, you know, pretty cracked along the way. But again, he did not lose heart. Why? Well, because Paul knew that the gain is eternal, but the pain is temporary. That's what he's talking about here. Not losing heart because we focus in on the gain and not on the pain. And so he comes right out and says, look, man, the outward man is perishing. But the inward man, that heart part, well, that's being renewed day by day. And Life has a way along the way of really keeping us humble, of even humiliating us, I guess is the way, and, and, and just reminding us of our frailty, uh, the things that we struggle with along the way. I call it the humility of humanity. You know, some, so many people are puffed up in pride, and you think, how can you be? I mean, how, how could you be if you've lived a little while? I mean, uh, it just has a way of bringing you back down to earth and things, you know, and 
I went to the doctor the other day, and that's just one of those humbling experiences in and of itself. You know, just having to admit, I go for the annual physical like once every 10 years, you know, and, and I, I'm married, and, and so that's what wives do, right? They, they make appointments for their husbands to go to the doctor, you know, because otherwise we just never would, you know. And so I go to this doctor, and, and, and uh, it, it's a lady, and, and I, that's okay, and, I, and I've... You know, it's all right. I mean, it, it, I, she's good. It's not the question. You know, it's good referrals and everything. But it's the first time, really, I've had a lady doctor. I'm just telling you that. And so, so I'm a little nervous, I guess, in a way. And so I went in, and, and uh, I'm reading things on the wall and just seeing where she went to school and all that sort of thing. And, and then they come in to do your weight, you know. And, and, and that's humbling, I suppose, to get your weight there. And, and so I, I, I step up on the scale, and I'm like, Hey, I like that. That's a good reading. You know, it was lower than usual. And I'm thinking, yeah, man, I've been kind of working out lately and <laughs> taking care and stuff. And, and then the lady helping me, the assistant says, that can't be right. You know, she looks at me and says, that can't be right. <laughs> I'm like, well, it could be. I mean, she, no, it can't be. And then we look down and there's something jammed underneath the scale, <laughs> you know. And so they move it and it's like, clunk, you know, and then they got a glunk. Glunk, glunk, you know, moving the thing over to, oh, that's more like it, you know, and so, so I'm nursing my wounds from that, you know, as, as I go in, and, and, and the, the assistant comes back into the room and says, here, put this on, and I'm like, that's all of it, you know, and, and it's one of those gowns that's open in the back, you know, and, and you're, you try, you're in there for a few minutes, and you're like trying to try different ways of doing it, and no matter what you do, it's like a sheet that's just too short. Nothing you do, it, no matter how you do it. You try and look cool, you know, like, yeah, to do this every day, you know, or whatever. But it's just not possible to look cool. You can feel cool, kind of breezy and all that. But, but then I heard that sound, the snap of the rubber glove. And I'm like, oh, man. I knew there's no way I'm coming out of this with any dignity if I had any to begin with. So I just decided, well, as long as I'm already embarrassed, I invited her to church. You know, I said, hey, <laughs> I've seen what you do. Uh, maybe you can. <laughs> now, I don't see her here tonight, and I'm actually kind of glad. You know, I was like, that's just one of those things that, no, go somewhere else. There's a lot of churches, you know. But as we think about this chapter here, there's some good weight gain in it, right? I mean, you know, there's things that you look at and say, man, the eternal way to glory. Yeah, I like the sound of that. You know, I like the sound of that weight gain. It far outweighs every pain or every sorrow in our life. And the old style scale is such a good picture for us to see. And you've seen it with the scales of justice, if you've ever seen that picture. It's, it's an arm across the top and you have two bowls, one on each side and then a fulcrum in the middle. And what you would do is put stuff on this side and stuff on this side and whichever side's heavier, it would go to that side. And so... You know, as you think about that scale, he's talking about that, that eternal weight of glory that far outweighs anything that's on the other side. And so oftentimes in our life, we, hear, we will hear bad news. You know, pray for my results. They're coming back Monday. I'm hoping that everything's cool. I feel cool. Everything's good, you know. But sometimes you hear bad news and you go, man, that's heavy. You know, it is heavy. The heavy pain or, uh, of someone's past or what they're going through now or whatever. And, and oftentimes I find myself just thinking about that word. You know, I, I had a Volkswagen van and that, that's kind of a hippie word. You know, whoa, heavy, man. But wow, that is heavy. But the glory of eternity is so much more exceeding and abundantly heavy than that. So any pain, no matter how much it is, it's not minimizing the pain. It's just maximizing the gain on the other side. It doesn't matter how bad it was. Well, Paul's able to say, everything that I've gone through, everything that I will go through, is light and momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. And that's why he was able to say, man, I don't look at the pain. I look at the gain. And there's going to be some heavy afflictions in every life when it comes to health and family and financial things and all that. And it can be very discouraging. And we can find ourselves losing heart and feeling faint and saying, I just can't go on unless we say, well, wait a minute. All of this on this side, man, it can't even stack to what's on the other side. And our afflictions are working for us, not against us. That's hard for us to remember. But if we do, boy, we're going to face life totally differently when we believe that and we know it. That this, hey, this is working for me. This isn't against me. It is for me. 
How can that be? Well, one thing that afflictions do is they wean us of the world, don't they? They make us say, man, I can't wait to get out of this place and see my Savior face to face. I, I long for the Lord's return. And you have that eye on the eternal, and it actually has you live a more fruitful and godly life here. Because the Bible said where your heart is, that's where, where your treasure is, your heart will follow it. So if your treasure is in heaven, well, your heart will be heaven bound. And this earthly pain, whatever it is, I can say, you know what, this is just working for me some more eternal gain. And that'll keep me from losing heart and keep us from doing the same. Now, we think about this, the heart part, just closing it out. With Jesus in our heart, at the core of our lives, at the center of our being, you know what, it is very possible, it's very, we are able now to go through the hard parts. If we have him in the heart part, we're able to go through the hard parts in life without losing heart, without giving up, without giving in. And the thing is that sometimes, I'm about as old as that Volkswagen van was when it went to VW Heaven. I, I was doing the math, you know, and I'm going, well, yeah, it was about the same, same time there. And so sometimes I feel like I'm just kind of rust and dust and duct tape. You know, that, that's kind of what's holding me together. And, and more and more I say, man, I think some things are, maybe I should stick that sticker on my back. You know, if I could find it, uh, please honk. If something falls off, you know, if I'm walking down the hall and you see something that I could still use, uh, please put it back. But whatever else we lose in this life, whatever it might be, you know, I've lost my keys of all my thing, all the things I've lost. I miss my mind the most, some say. <laughs> but we don't have to ever lose heart. We don't have to lose the heart part of our life. We don't have to let that part go. But what if Jesus isn't in a person's heart? What if he really isn't at the center and core of a person's being? What does that mean? Well, it changes the answers for all of these things because you think about them, just reviewing them for all of us. Hey, mercy or merit? Well, you know, with, with Jesus at our center, at our core, as our Savior, hey, there's a mercy. God sees us with merciful eyes. But you know what? The Bible says that without Christ, the only option is to make it on your merit. Your own performance. Well, you say, well, I, I think I could do that. Isn't it like those scales? That as long as my good and bad kind of, you know, a little more good than bad, I'm okay. No, the Bible doesn't say that. It says absolute perfection. That's God's standard for working your way to heaven. You say, well, well I, I don't think I could do that. Well, exactly. See, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But there's no mercy for anyone who does not have Christ in the heart of their life. And so we think about the second one. I, I said to live for Christ and not Christianity. See, without Christ, at best, what a person could have is a religion. They might be able to have maybe some truths or some traditions or a set of values and all the rest of that. But, see, Paul had that certainly in his life. He had a moral standard. He had a moral code. And there are so many who do equate, well, I went to church with I came to Christ. But it's not the same thing. It's that personal relationship. That's what God always went for. He, he said, man, I, I, I need your heart. I need your heart. That's what, it's really that heart part that I'm after. Not, not the outward, not the show or anything else. Deep down, is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Is he at, he at the center of what your life's all about? I, we talked about living for the contents and not the container. And What's the content of a life without Christ? Well, without even knowing every person on the earth, God certainly knows every person on the earth. And this is what he says. He says, you know what? You're a clay pot. And the only thing that makes it valuable is the treasure inside. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of mud and dirt. And you may look at a person's life and say, man, that's a pretty pot. You know, that person's got some nice glaze on the outside of it, you know, and is real shiny. But I heard someone once say to me, you know what? The higher the gloss, the cheaper the merchandise. And you look at that thing and say, sometimes, you know, people polish that pot, but inside, empty lives. Man, lives that are void. And yeah, the heart's beating, but the life just isn't there. And especially as life goes on and on, if there's no light in the center of a person, there's no candle of Christ in there, you know what? You crack, you press that thing, you put some despair and some hardship and some difficulty into that life, and it's amazing how more and more obvious it becomes that, hey, there's no light in this life at all. And one of the saddest things I think in life, I've done it before, is to be around somebody toward the real tail end of their life if they do not have the treasure of Christ inside. Man, it's just very sad. I mean, angry young men are a drag, but angry old men, empty old men and women are really a bummer. And so you can look at those things growing old without Jesus. What a sad thing that is. 
And then you see looking at the gain and not the pain. We talked about that. Everyone will live forever somewhere. I like to think of it that way. Every person I meet, everywhere I go, they will live forever somewhere. And there's only two choices. The Bible makes it so clear. People want to shrink away from this sometimes, but the Bible makes it so clear we can't ignore it. There are only two choices, heaven and hell. There's no in-between and kind of, well, I'd like to hang out in the middle for a millennium or something. like. No, no, no. It's one or the other. And for those who are headed to heaven, well, yeah, there's some trouble here on earth, that's for sure. But at worst, Paul described it as light and momentary affliction here on earth. And he says, on the other side of eternity, what do you have? An eternal way to glory. But then flip that around. See, for those who are headed to hell, what's it mean? Well, at best, they might have some light and momentary glory here on earth. You know, their time in the sun, their... their 15 minutes of fame and fortune or whatever it else it, it may be. But that's followed by an eternal weight of affliction, of pain. And for those who reject Jesus, you think about that. This life is as good as it's ever going to get for them. And hey, that's not that great. Even the best of lives, you know, you know that, that's it. And for those who follow Jesus faithfully, well, to live is Christ, the Bible says, to die is gain. So this is the worst things will ever be in my life. Even if they get worse and worse and worse for the next several decades, that's light and momentary compared to an eternal weight of glory. And that's why we as a church and we as individuals, we preach Christ. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only good news that there is. That's what the gospel means. God's good news. What is it? That you can be forgiven and headed to heaven. That you can have that assurance that, hey, when this heart stops beating... Eternity starts, and guess what? It starts in the face of Christ. That's where I'll be. On my merit? No. On God's mercy. And that's why this, Calvary Chapel Kendall, we always want it to be this way. It's a mercy ministry. It's a mercy ministry. And God wants to give you eternal life for free. Not because it's not worth a lot, but because you can't pay. Because I can't pay. It's beyond our ability to pay. So God says, i got to give it as a gift. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is. And you imagine with me how ridiculous this idea would be. Ed McMahon at the door, you know? Remember that guy, Reader's Digest? I don't know if he's even still alive anymore. But he, he was the guy with the million-dollar check. You know, they would bring, bring that big, huge check. And I was always, as a kid, kind of watching out the door in between punching the bozo. You know, I was watching for Ed McMahon. And imagine Ed McMahon out there with the camera crew and everything else, and there's the check with your name on it, and me telling my family, don't open the door. It's Ed McMahon. He's got a million dollars. I don't want it. You know, or whatever. I said, this kid's crazy. What is he thinking? And yet Jesus said, you know, I stand at the door of a person's heart, and I knock, and he stands at the door of every heart and knocks, and so many people, they hear that knock, and they say, don't answer it. Don't open that door. He'll ruin your life. Keep it closed. And the only explanation is found here in this chapter. Why would somebody do that? Well, it says hard hearts and blind minds. Back at the beginning of this chapter, he, Paul said, man, the God of this age, little g, the opposite of God with a big G, says that false God has blinded the minds of people, veiled them. A lot of times people say, oh, blind faith. You know, Christians got to leave their mind at the door. Listen, if you left your mind at the door, please at least pick it up on the way out. Uh, you know, and, and if you left your Bible here too, we have a growing number of those. But <laughs> it's in the lost and found if you, if you can't find your mind. But you don't have to leave it at the door. We like to think these things through. But you know, there's nothing blind about faith. It's, it's unbelief that's blind. And people will believe just about anything when they've rejected the truth. Can I give you an example as we close out? I was at the zoo, Metro Zoo, right up the, the road here, you know, a little while back, and there was a video playing, you know, or kids going around and stuff, and there was a PhD, and he had multiple letters after his name. I kind of lost track and everything, but he's, they're giving an explanation for the kids on how life as we know it came to be apart from God, you know, and so he talks about those, you know, millions and billions and trillions of years and all this, and this is what it said. A lizard was running and jumping to catch a dragonfly. Now, it never really addressed where the dragonfly or the lizard came from, but that's another issue. And it says that one day that lizard had a little extra flap of skin, one lizard did, and it flapped a little harder than the other lizards, and it caught the dragonfly. And so it now had a natural advantage. And so 
over millions and billions of years, that's where birds came from. Now, I was waiting for him to say, and then the prince kissed the princess and they lived happily ever after and there's a nice fairy tale for all you kids. No, he never said that. He was serious and pumping that into the minds of the kids. Now, my kids even can see through that and go, Dad, leaping lizards? I don't think so. And so, you know, people, again, they'll believe just about anything so that they don't have to believe the truth because there's parts of the truth that are inconvenient, which is I have no merit and I need God's mercy. And so when you think about it, every person has a God-shaped hole in their heart that only Jesus can fill. That's, that's what everybody is looking for, but they look to fill it with something else. You know, we try and fill that hole in the heart, a career, a relationship, or something. I just think, man, if I just over the next hill, I'm going to fill that hole if I just get another possession, I used to think it was Volkswagen, strangely enough. I mean, I was just more and more of them. That's what I need, another one, a different one, one with a roof rack or one with this or something else. I, I, empty. Each one of those things leave you empty. And you say, what is missing? You know what's missing? If you've never given your heart to Christ, there's something missing in the heart part of your life, and that is Christ. The Bible says he formed your heart physically. He knows everything about you, and he's knocking on your heart tonight spiritually. And the question is, will you open the door? Will you let the light of the world shine into the darkness of your heart today? Scientists say that in an average lifespan, there's one billion heartbeats. Think about that for a minute. A billion of these things, you know, and it just kind of happened. But, you know, God created us with this incredible intricacy, but there is going to come a time when the billion runs out. You know, not all of us will even make it to a billion. Uh, heartbeats, but you think about it, there's going to be that last one where it stops, and that's where eternity starts. And so, what does the Bible say? It says we, if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we'll be saved. God makes it as simple; He makes it so simple that that a child can understand it, but so profound that we could study it for the rest of our lives and still be in awe of it. So here tonight, if you don't have a relationship with God, I want to give you an opportunity that the Bible is putting out that to invite Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, to put Him in the center of your being, to say, I'm a sinner, but I need Him at the center. How do we do it? Well, what we're going to do is just close our eyes. We're going to bow our heads, and we're going to pray. And at the end of that prayer, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand, to acknowledge your need, to say, you know what? I'm here tonight, brought by a friend came with a family member. I've seen that their life has changed. I've seen what a difference it's made to them for the creator of the universe to come into their life. I'm not offering you here a relationship with a church. We already talked about that, or a pastor or a priest or anything else. It's the creator of your heart would like to come home to it. So let's pray. And if at the end of this prayer, that's your need, that's your desire, make that declaration today by raising your hand.